We now welcome actor, composer, producer Omar Epps. He is no stranger to controversial roles or outspoken opinions. He's joined me a couple of times before to share his thoughts on politics and America's leaders, and I'm happy to have him back today to talk about Donald Trump's surprise victory over heavily favored Hillary Clinton. We'll get Omar's assessment of President Obama's administration, what he sees for the future of the causes he champions under a Republican-controlled government. He's also the co-star in the new USA Network series, Shooter, and one of the many stars in the just-released film, Almost Christmas, which we'll talk about in a little while. Okay, what was your reaction to last Tuesday? Um, I don't know. I kind of was, you know, shocked and then kind of not shocked. It was just, I mean, it is what it is, you know? And I think now is the time for us, at the end of the day, this is a guy we got to deal with, you know, in, in office, and, and it's about bringing the country together and, and trying to put together the right team of people. Um, but, you know, I just, I'm a New Yorker. Me so, too. you know, you're my Brooklyn guy. So, you know, we both know Donald has always been outspoken and I know, just 30 sort of, years. You know, I felt like a lot of this stuff uh, he, he campaigned on, I, I haven't really seen that in his past. You know, and, and so I think he was just pandering to a crowd that he knew that would resonate with. But I don't think that that's, you know, how his, he's going to be in office. So are you therefore finding a way to be hopeful? I'm always an optimistic person. Really? Yeah, yeah. And I think that it's a, we live in a very precarious time. Um, and we really need to, to come together. This is, the beauty about America is all these different cultures, all these different belief systems, but it, that we all in one place and we can find common ground. That's what we've done historically. That's what got us here. So we can't get away from that tradition. What's your assessment of the Obama years? Was this a rejection of that or was this an anomaly? Um, I don't necessarily know if it was a rejection of it. I mean, listen, Obama, I think he did as best the job as he could do. I think he spent his first term cleaning up a lot of mess that was made before him. Um, he, he, he had a lot of resistance from, you know, Congress the whole time. And I think his second term, he tried to do some heavy lifting of things that are very complex and layered and are not to be fixed in a four-year term anyway. But I think he set headway on, on you know, like, health care. It's a major issue in our country. And I think he's, it may not be the perfect thing, Obamacare, but at least the, the there's some good ideas there. So, again, people need to come together and rally around. I mean, he scaled, scaled us down with, with war, and, and um, I think he's, he did a, I think he did as best a job as, he's, as he could do. And he's pretty popular, according to all the polls. And she won the popular vote. You know, right. it's kind of strange. It's the whole year is strange. Yeah, and, and maybe it is a time when we need to rethink our election system, you know, because the layman's mind would say, well, if the majority of the people voted for this person, but this person won electoral vote, like, how does... That's when it seems like there's shenanigans in play, right? But, yeah, but, rigged, rigged. Oh, I mean, <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Had Hillary won the electoral vote, and he won the popular vote. It would have been a big rig story. You know what I mean? So, you know, I mean, I think I understand people, a lot of people, but my thing is when you look at the percentages of people who are registered voters who didn't vote, that's the nature of the problem. Over four million Democrats who voted last time did not vote. That's unacceptable. Obama's still comparatively young. What do you think he's gonna do? <laughs> Whatever he wants to do. I'm sure he wants to take a long vacation. <laughs> Why do race relations now appear worse? You know, that's a good question. Um, I think that, you know, race relations in our country have always been at play. Um, I think the having the first African-American man elected to office, um, I think, in a way, it, it diverted from certain realities that were happening still, right? And, and, and liberal-minded people wanted to think, oh, okay, we're finally past that. But in, in, in the real world, it, it, it still rears its head, you know, on, a, on every level. So it's something that I think we just have to continue to, to work at as to realize that we're one human race. Has Black Lives Matter made a great impact, do you think? I think, I think uh, in terms of bringing um, things to the forefront, yeah. I mean, 
if you have a, a marginalized, disenfranchised people, you know, and, and you back people's uh, up against the wall, they have no re response but to react in that in a way where people are fighting for their rights, you know, and, and it's, uh, you know, the notion of, you know, well, all lives matter. It's like, well, yeah, we, we know all lives matter, but we're not seeing all lives being gunned down, you know, by yeah. the, 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 you know, law enforcement in these absurd numbers, right? And at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a media play, right? Because most of the, the majority of law enforcement are law-abiding, you know, of course. human beings. So, so we're, we're still seeing a, a small fragment, but it still is what it is. So it needs to be addressed. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement um, has been powerful because it's, it's shedding light on that and it's saying we're not just going to stand by and watch this happen. Even black incarceration is out of whack in a sense because you're more likely to be found guilty if you're black. Right, and and the, the that's, courts and, the, all... and so if if you don't address it to at least acknowledging that, wow, that's that's true, you know, then we need to do something about that. Why does that happen? Then you really don't have a seat at the table. You know what I mean? To to discuss the problem because you have to acknowledge it as a reality first. It's endemic. But it's crazy. I don't understand prejudice. I mean, you have to grow up with it. Yeah. I don't understand it. Uh, why yeah. should the color, why should pigment mean anything? Anything. I mean, it's the history of our world. Yeah. Uh, but I think we're, we're, at least we're at a, a place where, listen, civil rights didn't, wasn't successful just because of, of the, the, you know, black people. There were a lot of white of people that didn't believe in that as well. Even when you go back to the abolitionists and slavery, a lot of white people didn't believe in that as well. So we come from an evolved way. There are certain people who, who are not down with that. And I think that we're the, in our modern times, we have to galvanize. So people who don't believe in that have to galvanize uh, in numbers and, and, and um, try to get ahead of this thing. Have you been profiled? I've been profiled before, yeah. Uh, Almost Christmas is about a large Amer African American family gathering for the holidays. Yeah, it looks very funny. Thank you. Is it a comedy? It is a comedy. It's a comedy, but it is a lot of heart in it, a lot of drama. It's about a family who's having their first holiday dinner after the passing of the matriarch. So you know, basically, the family's in mourning, they're in grief. You, you know, everyone has their personal issues, their interpersonal issues, but. It's a comedy because you know how it is family and holidays is some family you only see during the holidays. So everyone has an auntie such and such or a cousin this and that. You're like, oh, I got to see this person. But it's about laughing and, and, and it's about joy, pain, and, and at the end of the day, coming back together as one through love. Who are you in the film? Oh, and I play the family friend. The, I grew up next door to the family and, I, and my character's uh, there visiting his mom and uh, my character and Gabrielle Union's character had a thing when they were in high school, and he finds out she's recently divorced, so he's trying to rekindle that flame. You like doing comedy? I love it. I love it. I love to get to show those different layers um, that people don't expect from me because I'm known as a dramatic actor. Watch this from Almost Christmas. Twigs. Who's Twigs? My nickname in high school. Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. What's up? Oh, hey! You must be Naya. We haven't been properly introduced. I'm Malachi. Nice to meet you. Let me grab these bags. I got it. Don't bother. Let me help you with your bags. Why? Because I'm a woman, I can't help myself? No, because I'm a grown man, and that's what grown men do. Manji? Uh, Manji, don't forget to get the uh, uh, Eskimo pie from the store, baby. OK, mama. And would you get me uh, the, the uh, vinegar uh, potato chips, baby? All right, it's a mud in a mud OK, pie. mama. Hey, Rachel. You know he's single. Huh. You need two. I see a lot of promos for Shooter. Yeah. On the USA Network. Yeah. Who are you and what is Shooter about? Uh, I play a character named Isaac Johnson, who is uh, a former captain of the Marine Sniper Unit, and he's now uh, in the Secret Service. And Shooter is about. Uh, uh, Bob Lee Swagger, who's you know retired Marine sniper, and that's played by Ryan Phillippe, and um, it's about espionage and shadowy conspiracy stuff. But we had a lot of fun. It's it's a very layered, uh, textured uh, storytelling. At the, uh, on the surface, it looks like cat and mouse. So it looks like he's set up uh, uh, for for an attempted shooting on a world leader, 
and then he has to, he, he's chasing to find out who, who's behind that. And um, it's just, it's really well done. It's smart. It's not, you know, my character's not like just a bad guy. He's a person who believed in the system and believed that he was doing things for the greater good, but all that's relative. Do you have to learn a lot about weaponry? I learned a little. I saw some weapons I didn't know existed. <laughs> <laughs> some of those 50 cal sniper rifles. Are... Where did you shoot? Uh, we shot it in California. So we shot it up in Santa Clarita, up in the mountains, um, Los Padres, National Forest, all over. Was it a tough shoot? It was a tough shoot, but it was fun. We had a lot of fun because um, it's a, it's more cerebral than it looks like. You see in a lot of these action clips, but a lot of it is, um, it's a game of chess mentally and psychologically. So that, that stuff was really fun. Of all the characters you played, what did you feel the most kinship with? Um, that's a great question. I, I kind of look at each character as a piece of a bigger puzzle. But when I think of things like that, I, I, I have to always go back to the first thing that I ever did, because no, there's nothing like your first, you know? And um, here I was, a kid from Brooklyn, New York, had this dream of, you know, being an actor, being in, in the entertainment business, and boom, I get a shot, and so there's, there's nothing like that. What first. was the first? Uh, first one was a movie called Juice. So, um, you know, I was 17 years old. So I, it was all kind of surreal to me that it was happening, um, but there's nothing like the first. Were you always an activist? Um, Activist, yeah, I think so. You know, I've, I've always, always... spoke out. Yeah, yeah, I've always spoken out just for good, you know, right over wrong. And I think there's different ways to do that. I, hopefully I'm doing that with my art. Um, yeah, the White House cited you as a champion for change because of your advocacy of art education. Yeah. That seems to have been reduced in this country, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's it the first thing that gets eliminated in budgets. Yeah, and that's what we, we, we're fighting for because, you know, if it, weren't, if it weren't for uh, federally funded arts programs, I probably wouldn't be here. You know, you have these kids in certain areas, whether they're urban or rural, where, you know, their parents can't afford to send them to, you know, piano class or this or that. So if you have it publicly funded, you know, these kids would would, would channel their energies into something that helps them build their character, you know, build their, their minds and their hearts. And that's what the arts is. You've got over 25 years in the business now. Yeah. Seen a lot of change for the better with regard to minority employee? Yeah, I've seen a lot of change for the better. I mean, there's, there's always work to be done, right? We could, we, it's, when does it end? We're always gonna, you know, you, you get one dollar, you say, well, now I need two. You get two, you say, well, now I need five. So I think there's always room for change, but um, the fact that I'm, I'm still, still around and kicking is, is a testament to that, you know, things have gotten better. You say you're an optimist, right? Yeah. So are you optimistic about the next four years? Um, yeah, I mean, we'll see, we'll see. And, I, and, and I'm a realist, but I, I, I just feel that there's a lot of, you know, Trump is going to be exposed to a lot of information that he wasn't privy to that I think hopefully, you know, in terms of international policy, he's going to have to have the right team around him, people who know, you know, what they're doing. In terms of, you know, business and bringing back jobs, that's a lot easier said than done, but I think that's something that he'll be passionate about, you know, because that's, he's about making money, right? Like, that's his thing. So I think he, he actually might do well at something like that. But in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the politics of our society, in terms of how we deal with one another, you know, he's got he's to get out in front, you know. He can't just, like, they, you know, the, the KKK's behind him and he says, you know, well, well that's not right. You've got, you've got to word that in a more specific way so that people understand you don't believe in that stuff, you know. And they held a parade for him. Yeah. The KKK in North Carolina. Yeah, and that's, that's just, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. That's how I feel about it. Because I feel that, you know, honestly, people who think like that in, in my travels through the world, in my travels through this country, they're the minority. And I don't mean that by race. I mean that by thought. Most people, you know, are, are not, you know, imprisoned by their bigotry or their prejudice. Most people, you know, are, they listen. Even, you know, even you, you know, you can have people who disagree, but they, they, they come to a common ground and a common understanding because we live in the world together, so we got to be here. So I find, like, like, people who are, 
you know, extremists and racists are, in percentages, the minority. Hopefully, yeah, better be. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> you were executive producer of documentary Daddy Don't Go, yeah. premiered Father's Day. You said you hoped it would activate fathers to being present in their children's lives. Yeah. Is that improving? Do we have any statistics on that? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, you know, in in the urban community, I feel like it's a it's a pandemic, right? Like fatherless households, and and you know, I grew up in a fatherless household. So for me, I'm I'm passionate about um, you know males in general, but specifically young black males taking the reins of their fatherhood and, and being active in their kids' lives because. Ultimately, that empowers those children to be more productive citizens, emotionally, mentally, physically. You came out all right. I came out. I, I my mom is is incredible, you know. So I was fortunate, you know. But but not all kids have a have a mom like I grew up with. So thanks, Omar. Great seeing you. It's always great to see you. Man.